Hello and welcome to episode 5 of the history of BBC Micro Typing Games. If this is your first time watching this series then what took you so long? You should definitely check out the first 4 episodes to see what this series is about, but in short this video will see me looking at a variety of typing games that were published in the many computing magazines of the 8-bit era, trying to work out if it was ever actually worth the time it took to type them in. This episode is the third to feature games from 1983 and I'll be looking at 4 more magazines, all of which are from December of that year. All of them probably featured Christmas themed games, but I'm not going to be covering any of those in this video because nobody wants to see Christmas games in July. Also, because the mags are all from the same month, I'm just going to look at the four featured games in alphabetical order. So let's kick things off with the December 1983 edition of Your Computer. Here we have the front cover of the magazine then, it has to be said this particular version that was scanned was a bit of a tatty one, there's a big chunk missing there, there's lots of creases around the side of it, sellotape marks and things like that, but let's take a look at it anyway. So they've gone with a very red cover with a Christmassy theme as you'd expect for a December issue, but the Santa Claus on the front of this has got to be one of the most sinister Santas you've ever seen. He's kind of hunched over a crystal ball for some reason, which is not something you associate with Christmas. I think it's probably a dummy because the hand looks very rigid there, and yeah it's just weird looking. I couldn't even work out whether it was supposed to be a humanoid character or some kind of creature at first because it's so hunched over you can't see the eyes or anything like that. I thought there's maybe a black nose there but anyway I think it's just supposed to be a very sinister looking Santa and he's got a computer in his sack there but it doesn't look like a particularly good one that anyone would actually want for Christmas so yeah bit of a weird cover but we've seen plenty of those already in this series. In terms of the articles it features on the front cover, it mentions Vic and the Commodore 64 software server, choosing printers and 100 to 400 pound micros, I'm going to take a look at that second article in a bit more detail, Dragon Sky Shield, probably a game for the dragon I guess, and the BBC Carol service, so there's some kind of Christmas carols thing for the BBC micro, but I'm not interested in that whatsoever. It also mentions the competition of the year, dozens of prizes from a £1,200 advance to computer holidays and electronic games. So lots of prizes being given away for Christmas there, but unfortunately I'm about 40 years too late to enter that competition. Let's delve inside then and usually I'd start by looking at something quite early in the magazine like the contents page or news articles but in this one I'm actually going to jump all the way to page 73 for a very impressive looking advert from Lormasoft, the company founded by the famous Jeff Minter. As you can see there's already an impressive range of software available for Christmas 1983 including Metagalactic Llamas Battle at the Edge of Time, Laser Zone, Attack of the Mutant Camels, Hover Bother, Matrix Abduction and Grid Runner and you can see nice drawings representing all those games which really makes the advert stand out. Skipping on just a few pages to the news section and there's an article here about the Electron, more specifically how the Electron will grow, expansion boxes and there's a picture there of the Electron with an expansion unit on the back with a cartridge plugged into it. Looking a little bit more closely at the article, it says without detracting from the many positive features of Acorn's new baby, it does lack the RS-423 user and printer ports of its big brother, the BBC Micro. So basically this article is saying that these expansion units will soon be available to allow you to connect those peripherals to your Acorn Electron. It also mentions that it was recently claimed that 20,000 electrons have been ordered by British Telecom for a new medical network accessed through Prestel called The Chain. The network will enable doctors and nurses to get through administrative drudgery quickly on screen. I'm a little bit amused that that was ordered by British Telecom and not the NHS, but there you go, I don't know. And I don't know if that ever actually happened, but if it did and you know anything about it, then let me know in the video comments. I've now moved on to page 92 and this is the main feature I wanted to look at in this magazine, the 100 to 400 pound micro survey, also called On The Grid. And what this is is a comparison of all the major home computers that have been released in the 100 to 400 pound price range at this point in time, which is obviously perfectly placed in the December issue just in time for Christmas as people might be deciding which home computer they were going to invest in. This is a very extensive feature covering 16 pages, although a lot of those are adverts, and after an introductory page setting out what the article's about, it covers each of the major systems available at the time, comparing them on price and technical specifications, and giving a little summary about each one too. Clearly I'm not going to look at all of them in detail, but I'm going to pick out what ended up being the big hitters in the home computer market during this period. And the first of those is the Spectrum 48K. So here you can see a pretty random picture of the Spectrum with a finger poking one of the keys. It gives you the price, £130 at this point in time, gives all the technical specifications about processor, keyboard, memory, operating system and so on, and also mentions what it's like as a games machine at this point in time, saying masses of high quality cheap games software is available. And it summarises the Spectrum by saying it has a moving key keyboard which not everybody likes, I think that's an understatement. 
I think this is a typo here, but it says it's probable that your cost microdrive storage, but I think it means low cost microdrive storage, will bring about a large range of business software. It then says the lack of decent sound, but I think it means decent sound from basic is unlikely to matter in a business context. And the ability for several spectrums to access the same database through interface one is very useful in educational environment. And it then finishes off by saying the minimum business system should cost you £130 for the system, £30 for the interface one and two microdrives for £100. So a total cost of £260, but I can't really imagine that anyone used the Spectrum as a business computer. So now we move on to look at what it says about the BBC Micro and the basic overview of it is the same. Obviously the price is significantly higher at £399. It says for games a very large volume of quality software is available and it says the BBC computer has been with us for some time now and has made great inroads into business use. Its use in the educational field is also pretty extensive. A very fast version of BASIC with a built-in assembler, the machine to compare against for a low-cost business machine but will have extreme difficulty in holding that position in 1984. Strangely, it doesn't summarise the cost of setting this one up as a business system, though. And finally, I'll flip over to the last page of this article to take a look at the Commodore 64. At this point in time, the price of that was £229. Again, it gives the overview of the system and says for games, as the price of the 64 is lowered, it broadens its base and comes more into the games market. Understatement of the decade there. And the summary of it says the big brother to the million selling VIC-20 is let down by a limited version of BASIC, but it can be interfaced to a printer, disk drives and fitted with the CPM option. The Commodore 64 is supported by a reasonable library of business software. And for the minimum business system, they're substantially higher than the Spectrum, that's for sure, with the Commodore 64 costing 229 the disk drive costing the same, and the printer costing roughly the same as well. So you're looking at about £700 at this point in time for using the Commodore 64 as a business machine. And the last thing I want to look at in this magazine before moving on to the games listing is this two-page advert from Ultimate Play the Game advertising six of the games they had available at this point in time. What stands out particularly from here, other than the really nice artwork that's on display, is that these games only cost £5.50 each, including VAT and first-class postage and packing within the UK, which is a really decent price point for this point in time, and it's not surprising considering the quality of the games as well that they were so popular. At this point in time, the games were only available for the Spectrum other than Jetpack, which is also available for the 8K Expanded VIC-20. But as we know, these games were ported to a number of other systems over the next couple of years and proved to be hugely successful on all of them. I'll move on to the game listing from this magazine then now, and it's Fruit Worm for the BBC Micro, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be looking at it in this series. So there's a nice screenshot of it there, you can see it's quite a colourful game with some nice clearly defined graphics, cherries specifically in this screenshot, and there's also some rocks on the screen, and you can probably guess what kind of game it is, but just in case you weren't sure, it tells you in the opening paragraph that in Fruit Worm your task is to move a hungry worm around the garden which is full of fruits. You have to guide him so he can eat the fruits and grow to be an adult worm. The trouble is there are rocks and the brick wall to be avoided, and the task of keeping your wary eyes on the time which is constantly ticking away so yeah it's a variant of snake what's quite interesting about this one though is that it's split into three programs and it gives some very detailed instructions here how you've got to type them in save them and then type in another one and save it afterwards on the cassette there do seem to be a few mistakes in this article though because here it says you should type in listing 2 and save it under the name beef fruit but later on it says you should save it as fruit and it's also referenced as fruit both here and here and also it says that you should type in listing 3 and save it after init and fruit but it doesn't tell you what to call it although later on it does say that you should call the third program worm so that could trip you up a little bit if you weren't paying attention but presumably most people could interpret what they were supposed to do there so it says the reason all this must be done is because the program contains quite a bit of machine code and could crash the machine if there's a mistake, probably resulting in a bad program. It also says if you're fortunate enough to have a disk drive you won't have to go through all this, but you must make sure not to insert any extra space in the third program or they'll probably get a no room message. So this one looks like it could have been quite challenging to type in. The first of the three listings is in the bottom left corner of the first page and it's absolutely tiny. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit closer and what you can see is this is the initialization program. It's not doing anything particularly interesting, it's showing the instructions on the screen and then defining a bunch of graphical characters and also sound envelopes. The other two listings are a couple of pages further on. It also finishes the overview of the game by saying the programs are long and typing them in will be a long, boring and arduous process. If you don't have the time or energy for such a task, then send a cheque or postal order for £3.50 made payable to the author Shingo Sugiura, is that? To the following address, it's got his address there, and he'll send you a copy of the game on a high quality C15 cassette. So if you couldn't be bothered to type this in, there is an alternative option. Though I'm not sure you'd want to pay £3.50 for a snake clone even in 1983. So just to quickly look at the listings, listing 2 is a little bit more easy to read thankfully because there's a lot of numbers to type in there. It's just a huge stream of data statements to define each of the different fruits that you've got in the game. So presumably this section here from lines 50 to 120 is going to be defining a cherry. 
And moving down to the third listing, well, I think this text is even smaller than the one on the previous page. It's absolutely tiny, so I'm going to have to zoom in really closely to see anything of detail on this one. Unfortunately, when it's zoomed in, the quality of the scan isn't really good enough and it's quite blurry, so you'd have no chance of recreating this if you wanted to type it in now, I don't think. But what I can see in the final column of the listing on the right hand side here is a whole bunch of machine code commands which I don't really understand. But clearly this is using machine code extensively because there's more machine code in this than we've seen in any other listing so far. So needless to say it's quite a complicated program with the three different listings to type in and a lot of machine code commands that many people probably wouldn't understand. So I'm expecting this to be a reasonably sophisticated game for a type in listing. So let's take a look at it now and see if that proves to be the case. As expected the game begins with some instructions and it's a pretty elaborate description of how to play the game considering it's just Snake. The layout of the instructions is pretty nice with some good use of the Mode 7 colours and double height text. After two pages of instructions describing the gameplay you also get details of the keyboard controls and it's the by now classic BBC micro scheme of Z and X for left and right and colon and slash for up and down. You can also choose whether to have the sound on or off. The game then starts and you're presented with a green play area enclosed by a red brick wall and after a short tune is played, your snake materialises in the middle of the screen and you must move around collecting the fruit before the time runs out. The time is shown in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, your lives are shown in the bottom left along with a fruit indicating which level you're on which is a nod to Pac-Man of course, and at the top of the screen you can see your current score and the high score. There's not really much more to say about how to play the game, it's snake. You move around the play area collecting the fruits, avoiding the rocks, bearing in mind that your snake gets bigger with each fruit that you eat and make sure you don't crash into yourself or the wall. As expected this is pretty sophisticated for a type in game, it's got nicely drawn graphics including multicolor sprites for the fruits which is something rarely seen in basic typing games and is presumably achieved by the use of machine code and those extensive data statements in the second program listing. There's also some decent sound effects throughout the game and nice jingles at the start and when you lose a life. Gameplay wise it's obviously just snake but it is pretty challenging. The timer counts down very quickly so you've got to be really fast collecting the fruits to complete a level before it runs out. It really should be more lenient to begin with and that's something that could be tweaked in the code fairly easily. You don't have to get all the fruits to complete a stage though so that's some consolation but it seems to be a bit random as to how many you need to collect to finish a level. The play area is quite cramped due to using graphics mode too and your snake moves quickly so you need good reactions to avoid hitting the rocks or walls. The controls are fairly responsive but you can sometimes end up crashing into yourself when trying to drop down a line and double back and timing a turn can be quite tricky. The rocks and fruits are placed randomly each time you start a level which means you can sometimes die by crashing into a rock as soon as you start or it's near impossible to get some of the fruit. This is something that could perhaps have been better implemented in the code and could be tweaked to allow a safe area around the middle of the screen where you materialise. It takes some practice but I did manage to get quite far into the game after a few attempts and increase my high score on each successive play. The high score table is well implemented and clearly inspired by the one on Acorn Soft games of the time. Overall Fruit Worms a well programmed but pretty tough game and given it's just a variant of Snake it's arguable whether it would have been worth typing the listing in. That said if you were looking to understand machine code, chaining programs together and more sophisticated sprite design then there are some good building blocks here. Moving on to the next magazine then and it's the December 1983 edition of Personal Computer World and they didn't go for a Christmas theme cover at all, instead they've got a picture of a private detective with a handheld computer in a rather seedy looking neighbourhood thinking to himself this was a job for my PC8201A computer and that I think is NEC's rival to Tandy's handheld computer because it mentions that at the bottom of the page along with how to make your micro sync, Christmas programs extra and spreadsheets and databases 1983 which sounds absolutely riveting. As I've mentioned before when looking at personal computer world these magazines are huge this one's got over 400 pages and they're usually chock full of adverts and adverts is primarily what I'm going to be focusing on in this issue. So with that in mind I've skipped on to page 74 of the magazine an advert for the OM8064 materialising out of some smoke here which is not a good sign for a computer let's be honest. Now I've never seen one of these things before, I imagine it's primarily a business computer but it seems to come with two disk drives, it's got quite an impressive keyboard with a separate numeric keypad and some nice blue keys on the left and right there, it looks like a pretty decent keyboard quite similar to the BBC Micro and it's also got this thing attached to it that you can plug various circuit boards into which is what made it stand out to me in the first place when I was skimming through this magazine. 
It says the A264 packs all the power you'll ever need. Sleek and trim yet fully expandable with 8 slot expansion unit. The newly designed compact keyboard is a piece of art in itself. That might be a little bit of an exaggeration and it goes on to say you'll get much more including a powerful 64k dynamic RAM, up to 14k of ROM, 24 by 40 character text display with high resolution graphics and a 6502 and Z80 microprocessor. Sounds pretty impressive. It costs £1,080 plus VAT and you could get it from Tash Cole Computer Systems in Middlesex. It certainly looks impressive from the advert but given that I've never seen or heard of one before I suspect it wasn't very successful. So jumping forward into the middle of the magazine this is page 220 and I found this advert for adult video and computer games at long last and this is a very dodgy looking advert with text all over the place of different sizes from Silver Fox Communications from Clacton on Sea the UK's only specialist adult software distributor. And it's advertising games for the Atari 2600, ZX Spectrum, TRS-80 and Color Genie and the BBC Model B. Various games there mentioned including Soho Adventure, Sex Invaders, Cat House Blues, Philly Flasher, Gigolo and Beat 'em and Eat 'em, which was a famous game for the Atari 2600. And it's very proudly advertising the best of both worlds because it offers two games in one, a game for him and a game for her. So if you wanted a sexy game to share with your partner back in the 80s, then this was the company to go for, Silver Fox Communications. Skipping on almost another 100 pages and I'm now on page 308 and here's an advert from Leisure Base, the friendly new name in computers. And the main reason I've picked this out is because it handily shows the prices of all the popular home computers of the era, or nearly all of them, there's no BBC Micro on this one, but you can get an Atari 800 for £300, a ZX81 for £45, who would want that at this point in time, the Spectrum for £130, quid, the Oric for £140, the CGL M5 for £150, no thanks, VIC-20 Complete Starter Pack for £135, quid, the Commodore 64 for £200, and the Texas Instruments ti 99 for £100. So if you're looking for a new computer for the family for Christmas 1983 then Leisure Base had stockists all over the country and you could quite easily compare the prices for all the major machines at the time, apart from the BBC Micro as I said. And the final advert I'm going to look at in this magazine is this one from Asda. So Asda Price for every Tom, Dick and Einstein you can see they've got a variety of computers available from the supermarket. You've got the Texas Instruments ti 99 a again, the Mattel Aquarius and the ZX Spectrum pointed out on this advert. But what stuck out to me most is a couple of things. Firstly the logo for Asda stores at the time which is very different to the green one that you see now and also the fact that they were using the term Asda Price even back then in 1983. To be honest I can't even remember seeing an Asda until the 90s so I think they probably a more southern based company at that point in time but it is interesting that they sold computers directly from the supermarkets back then. So I'm now making my way to the games listing that I'm going to be looking at from this edition of the magazine but before I do I happened across this one Hexplode I'll just move back one page you can just see a screenshot from it there I'm going to move back to the page where the description is and the reason this one stood out to me and I was actually considering covering it in this episode is because I definitely played this one when I was a kid I think my dad maybe typed it in so what I'm going to do while I read the description of this is put a little bit of footage of the game on the screen and the description of it says Hexplode is a board game for two players that runs on the BBC B obviously. The board consists of a web of 25 hexagons, each player takes it in turn to place a counter on one of the hexagons and each one can support a limited number of counters, this limit being determined by the number of neighbouring hexagons. A1 for example can support two counters since it only has two neighbouring hexagons. When the limit is reached the hexagon explodes sending a counter to each adjacent one. This may cause a chain reaction as the neighbouring hexagons in turn reach their critical limit. Eventually one or the other of the players will have no counters left and the game is over. So yeah quite an interesting concept and it says the chain reaction is handled by a recursively defined procedure. The problem is that the game is not very interesting to look at and there's not much more I can say about it so I just thought it would be better to put a short clip in rather than covering it in any detail. So with that let's move on to the game listing that I am going to be focusing on in detail in this magazine and it's BBC Grid by Keith Miles. As you can see the font size is tiny here so I'm going to have to zoom in and it says Grid is an arcade style game for the BBC B. The game bears a passing resemblance to Space Invaders but these invaders are more sparse and somewhat more intelligent than the usual descending droves of green morons. It goes on to give further details about the game saying you've got to destroy all the aliens before they reach the ground and they don't just continue their mindless descent while you sit and take pot shots at them. Later levels introduce a homing missile and at the beginning of the game you have 200 units of fuel which is used up extremely rapidly even if you sit still and don't fire any missiles. To replenish fuel you must shoot the fuel dumps deposited randomly around the screen by the XY droids. After further information about how to play the game and what will kill you it finishes off by saying you'll see why it's called grid when you run it. Moving on to the listing then, I've had to zoom in a little bit closer still because the text is so small. The one thing I did notice right at the top is this REM statement, it says REM the grid, copyright K-Miles and he's even put his address in, 4 Willow Walk, Ely, Cambridgeshire. It really was a simpler time back then wasn't it, when we were willing to share personal information in a nationally published magazine. 
Anyway, moving on from that, there's nothing really outstanding in this listing that we haven't seen in previous editions of this series. You can see a variety of procedures which are defining various elements of the game. We've got the one that defines the character sprites here. There's one that deals with the display and movement of your ship and another one dealing with the missiles you fire. And it's all wrapped up in a game loop near the top of the listing that repeats a number of procedures over and over again until you run out of fuel. The listing continues onto the following page which mostly deals with the instructions. And you can see that it's a pretty short listing with roughly 150 lines, so not too arduous to type in. So it looks like a pretty straightforward basic listing, but let's take a look at the game now and see how it shapes up. The game begins then with a combined title and instructions screen. There's no instructions in mode 7 like there is on a lot of these games. Instead, the program has incorporated the instructions on the game's title screen. And it says, can you halt the alien invasion of the grid? Avoid colliding with the aliens and evade the fallout from your own missiles. Beware of Homer. Homer being the homing missile that appears in later stages. It also says, hit the fuel dumps dropped by the XY droids to refuel. There's a very colourful summary of all the objects you're going to find in game and then there's the controls which are a little bit awkward, caps lock and control for left and right, a square bracket and shift for up and down, return to fire and space to panic which I'll explain later. In the background there's a kind of droning noise that changes pitch. It's pretty annoying but it's also quite familiar. I think this is another game I played when I was a kid and that would make sense given that the game Hexplode was in the same magazine I definitely played that. The one thing I didn't mention about the title screen was the red grid in the background and that's maintained when you start the game as you have to move your blue ship horizontally and vertically along the lines of the grid and destroy the green aliens before they reach the bottom of the screen. You can only fire one bullet at a time and they don't travel particularly far so you do have to get close to the aliens to destroy them. When they do they leave behind some fallout which is deadly to the touch so you've got to avoid that as well. If that wasn't enough to contend with, you've got to replenish a fuel level that's constantly dwindling, and you do that by shooting the fuel pods that materialise randomly on the screen. Apparently they're dropped by the two XY droids that are on the left and bottom of the screen, although it doesn't always seem to line up that way. Eliminate all the aliens and you'll move on to another wave, which is more of the same except the enemies move faster than on the previous stage. After a few stages the Homer will appear. It's a pink at symbol that follows you around the grid. Contact with this or any other hazards on the grid will see you lose your one and only life and if you've managed to set the high score it'll be recorded at the bottom of the screen. This Chunky Mode 2 game looks very much like an early Jeff Minter offering but I think it's an original idea though clearly Space Invaders influenced. The graphics are nice enough being colourful and distinctive with everything standing out from the background. The sounds are pretty unremarkable bleeps though. The gameplay is actually pretty addictive and there's lots to keep on top of with dispatching enemies, shooting fuel pods and avoiding projectiles. It's easy enough to begin with but gets a lot more frantic once the homing missile arrives. This ups the difficulty considerably as you have to continually move around. I have to say though it was pretty lazy of the programmer to just make it an at symbol. As I mentioned you only have one life so you need to be very alert as there's lots of things that can kill you and you also need to keep your fuel topped up. If you get into too much trouble you do have the option to hit the panic button but that's a teleport rather than a smart bomb so it can do more harm than good. The controls can be a little sluggish to respond due to the amount of processing going on to move everything around and it's frustrating that you can only fire one shot at a time. Also annoying was the fact that my best run on the game ended by me crashing into a fuel pod that materialised right in front of me. It's a pretty challenging game with one mistake costing you dearly so it would benefit from more lives, a high score table and less awkward keys, all of which could easily be changed in the listing. So overall I found this a decent little shooter which had enough originality to stand out from the crowd in that era. Moving on to the third magazine and game listing then and there's absolutely no doubt that this is the Christmas edition of Practical Computing. This is the first edition of this magazine that I've featured in this series and it's a reasonably straightforward looking cover, logo at the top there with an interesting U in computing and the image they've gone for is a very traditional Christmas image, you've got the Christmas tree in the background, two rosy faced children sitting in front of a very old television with a game on it and I don't know what they're playing this game on because this does not look like a computer to me, let's just zoom in and take a closer look at that. So as I said I don't know what this is, it doesn't represent any computer or console that I'm aware of, it seems to have two dials on the right hand side and then a bunch of buttons which don't really look like a keyboard, so yeah very strange interpretation of kids playing video games at Christmas but there it is. This magazine has a cover price of 85 pence and it's got over 200 pages so pretty good value for your 85p I would say and it looks like the coverage is a mixture of business and gaming because here's a list of very business orientated computers the Hewlett Packard Model 16, the Olivetti M10 Portable, 64k Atari 800XL, Commodore 64 WP I assume that's word processing and it's got an exclusive in this magazine Microsoft's Word that'll be an interesting thing to look at as of 1983. So without further ado let's dive into the magazine and see what it has on offer. 
So the first thing I came to that I thought was quite interesting was this, what looks like an article about choosing a home micro. But if you look closely at the bottom here, it says it's an advertisement and it does continue on to the following pages. And it's saying choosing a home micro can be a daunting task to the newcomer. And with the ever increasing number of micros emerging on the market, even upgrading, say from a ZX81, can be a risky and expensive exercise if the wrong decision is made. It then goes on to give lots of information about the pitfalls and key points to look for. One thing I noticed here is it says don't buy a games machine, which is an interesting point because I think most people probably were looking for a machine that you could play games on as well as perhaps doing more serious things. It then goes on to say key points to look for, high resolution colour, high quality sound, keyboard, RAM, computer language, expansion and software. I'm not going to go into all the details there because then at the bottom here it says to find out which company offers you the right choice with good value, high specification, quality micros, a quality four colour plain paper printer or plotter, communications modem, micro disk drives and comprehensive and growing range of software turn over and this is where it all becomes clear as to what this advert's all about because here's a big double page spread the right choice for real computing the auric one so yeah this was just a glorified way of trying to say that the auric one's the computer you should be buying lots more information and pictures here including a big picture of the computer itself the growing system which notes you can get three inch micro floppy disk drives and a printer or plotter there's some mention of some software that you can get in the bottom right there and also lots of information about just how great the auric is of course, history tells us that none of this really made much of a difference because the Auric one was a bit of a flop all in all. Moving on to page 70 then, I couldn't not have a look at this review of Microsoft Word as it was in December 1983. And the subtitle says, even without a mouse, this package has plenty to teach the others. With one, Chris Bidmead found it was like a month of birthdays. So clearly he was pretty impressed with the fact you can use a mouse with Word at this point in time. So obviously I'm not going to read through the whole article because there's a lot of text here. But let's have a quick look at the introduction, the conclusion and some of the screenshots of the product. So it begins by mentioning some of the other word processing products available at the time. WordStar, Memorite, WangWriter, PerfectWriter, PeachText, Spellbinder and similar extensions to journalistic fingertips have been pretty thoroughly digested in this office over the years so excitement over a new word processing package is rare but the author is euphoric about Word, also rather clumsily known as Multitool Word, the latest fruit of the current 16-bit burst of creativity by Bill Gates and his team at the Microsoft Corporation of Bellevue, Washington. It's quite funny to think of a time where Microsoft and Bill Gates weren't common knowledge but this was that time. Anyway, let's move on and have a look at the screenshots. And here's the biggest one. You can see it's a very basic layout at this point in time. You've got five windows on the screen there. And at the bottom it says screen windows can be used to display text from several files. The four line menu is a permanent feature. That's referring to the four lines at the bottom of the screen, which have got the commands and various other information about the documents that you've got open. Zooming in more closely to look at the other two smaller screenshots, you can see one says horizontal bars show where windows fall and the other one says the mouse adds an extra cursor. So while this isn't Windows and Microsoft Windows was still a good number of years away, you can already see the seeds of that product being sown here. But skipping on to the third and final page of the review, let's have a look at the conclusion about the product. And the reviewer says Microsoft Word is a logically clear, many talented new word processor that adds considerable luster to the IBM PC. Even without the graphics board and mouse, Word has a lot to teach existing word processing packages. With them, it's a revelation. At £275, it looks like value for money. Well, I guess at that point in time, that was actually a reasonable price to pay for a word processing package. You can also buy it bundled with the mouse for £340, which is a real bargain. But if you go for the mouse, then cost in the IBM graphics board at a further £216. It's not essential, but you'll be hard put to resist having the full kit. So overall, it's fair to say the reviewer was very impressed with Word, and obviously, as we know, it would go on from strength to strength from that point, although there's plenty of people who would disagree that Word's a good product now. I've now moved on to page 133 in an article entitled Games Choice. Jack Schofield picks the micro games which stand up best to the test of time, and this is a top 10 games according to this writer. I'm going to skip past the first page which has a big picture of Zaxxon which doesn't actually feature in the top 10 and move on to this double page spread showing the top 10 games according to this feature. And quite an interesting selection it is. It seems that the author of this article is very much into more serious games because we've got Colossal Adventure and The Hobbit, so two text adventures on there. We've also got two adaptations of board games in Cyrus Chess and Scrabble. Surely it's better to play Scrabble as the original board game than on a computer. But there are a couple of arcade style games including Jeff Minter's Grid Runner and Defender. There's also Star Raiders, which is a mixture of action and strategy. There's Eastern Front, which is a war game. And perhaps quite notably, an early version of Microsoft Flight Simulator, which still continues to be released to this day. The screenshot of that actually looks quite decent for 1983. And the final game here is a maze game called Way Out. So not the top 10 computer games I would have come up with in December 1983, but an interesting list nonetheless. And the final thing to take a look at before moving on to the game listing is this, the Act Sirius SX 10MB 256K of RAM. 
This is an absolute beast of a computer for this point in time with a hefty price tag of £3,995 and it's an early example of a PC compatible if we take a look at the specifications on the right hand side here. It's got a Winchester subsystem which is basically a hard disk, it's 10.6 megabytes. imagine 10.6 megabytes being cutting edge. It's an integral Winchester drive with twin platters and 134 millisecond average access time. It's also got 256k of RAM which again was massive for this point in time, an Intel 8088 16-bit processor yep this is a 16-bit system in 1983 1.2 megabyte double-sided floppy disk drive and an 800 by 400 pixel high resolution graphics display and if all that wasn't good enough it also seems to shoot lasers clearly this was aimed at the business market nobody was going to be paying four thousand pounds for a home pc and there's no denying that at this point in time this is a seriously decent piece of kit so I'll now move on to the games listing which is part of a section on BBC programs and well I've got a little bit of a problem here because for some reason the scan of the page that it's on is upside down so I've had to download this page spin it round and I'm viewing it in paint now instead. Looking at the overview of this game it's not boding particularly well. It starts off by saying if you can't sit back and tap the force you'll last 10 seconds in this game by Chris Carr of Eversham which is based on a once popular arcade game. The writer goes on to say he finds it disconcerting that sheer effort should be so unavailing but the ability to react without thinking has always been recognised in some circles as a talent worth cultivating, which I think is a long winded way of saying this game's going to be hard. That's further reinforced by the final sentence in this column saying for myself I didn't notice the existence of a score facility until I went back to Mr Carr's letter. It goes on to give a little bit more information about the enemies you'll see in the game and also what the keyboard controls are but we can cover that when we actually get into the game so let's move on to the listing. For the most part there's not a lot here that we haven't seen before, I did like the fact that at the top here it says on error run, which makes it sound like if an error did occur all it would do is try and run the next line which is almost certainly going to result in yet another error. After that the program clearly prints the instructions on the screen and uses a command I've not seen before which is SPC followed by a number and that's basically printing a number of spaces on the screen so that's quite a nice way of achieving a tab I suppose. From there we move into the main program loop starting at line 160 and I would say it's fairly unsophisticated. You've got the usual calls to various procedures including proc define at the beginning there which goes off and defines all the graphics characters but after that there's not a lot of call to procedures until later on where it's dealing with the various projectiles and bombs that can be fired. The main program loop ends at line 420 where it then loops back to line 200 and repeats the sequence of events again. Moving back to archive.org for the second page of the listing which was reproduced the right way round, I noticed several occasions where the program uses a command called hi mem in an if statement. I wasn't sure exactly what that was although it suggests it's got something to do with memory. So I went off to an online copy of the BBC user guide to find out what it does. And the user guide describes hi mem as containing the address of the first byte that basic does not use. This pseudo variable must not be altered while executing a function or procedure. Alter it with great care. So on each occasion this is used it seems to have values added to it and then the resulting value is either stored or used in an if statement. I'm not exactly sure what purpose that serves but I can only assume it's somehow used to make sure that the program doesn't run out of memory. So those two commands SPC and HiMem were probably the most interesting things I noticed in this listing that I hadn't spotted in previous ones. The listing ends at line 1460 so that means 146 lines of code which means it's not a particularly big listing just like the previous one, the grid. So the big question I'm sure you're all asking is what kind of game did that produce? Well, let's find out. As usual things begin with an instructions screen and this one's very basic just white text on a black background saying see battle at the top and it says your task is to destroy the waves of attacking submarines, fighter aircraft and helicopters using the following controls and the controls are full stop and slash to move left and right and A to fire a missile that's an upward shot and Z to drop a depth charge which is a downward shot. These are quite commonly used controls for a BBC Micro game but I have to say they're not the most intuitive for this game. You also then have to choose which level you want to start on with 0 being hard and 1 being easy. The only difference between them as far as I know is the speed that the enemies move at. Once you've chosen your difficulty level you can press any key to start the game but I'll warn you now that if you blink you may well miss my first couple of attempts at this one. As you'll see if you didn't blink the game is a variant of the old arcade game Depth Charge which was already a good 5 years old in 1983. You control a boat in the middle of the screen moving left and right across the surface of the sea and you've got to drop depth charges to destroy the submarines and fire rockets upwards to destroy the helicopters and planes that fly above you. One of each of these enemies will appear at any one time, appearing at a random elevation or depth depending on which kind of enemy it is. When they get in line with your boat they'll fire a projectile and this is where the problems occur as you'll already have seen by now as when the plane flies really low over your boat it'll drop a missile that'll kill you with almost no chance of avoiding it and as with many typing games of this era you've only got one life. It is possible to shoot the enemy projectiles but it seems random whether you'll actually manage it or not. 
The graphics and sound are functional enough, but this is barely a game in its current state and having to go back to the title screen and choose your difficulty level every time you die makes it even more annoying. I only ever managed to get about 60 points before being put off by its excruciating difficulty level. This is absolutely no fun at all. Rounding things off, I couldn't do an episode of this series without taking a look at a copy of the micro user and here's the December 1983 issue. Strangely no Christmas theme at all to the cover for this one, instead they've gone for a picture of Big Ben with a shower of BBC micros around it. Bit of a strange cover for a Christmas edition and the only Christmas theme content that's mentioned on the cover is some listings including Fly Santa's Saucer which I think is a game, meet the pixels on your Christmas tree and make your BBC micro the star of your Christmas party. And then it also says pit your wits against the phantoms of Tower Bridge and that's actually related to the game that I'm going to be looking at from this magazine. The other noteworthy thing on the front cover is that it includes a free issue of Electron User. As I mentioned in the previous episode, the publishers of the Micro User did also publish Electron User, and initially that began as a pullout in the Micro User before eventually becoming a standalone magazine. And I'm going to take a look at that pullout in a little bit more detail. First though I'm going to jump to page 27 and if you watched the last episode of this series you might recall me briefly looking at an article that featured two robots that you could control with your BBC Micro and this is one of them, the BBC Buggy. As you can see there's a big picture of it at the top there in this advert. The most notable thing to point out here is the price of it which is £189. So if you wanted a robot that you could control with your BBC Micro that's the price you'd have to pay. And just to briefly zoom in on the advert, firstly check out this guy's hair, that's an amazing 80s hairstyle and also let's have a look at some of the programs that were provided for you to use with your new electronic pet. They include Switch which gives direct computer control, Memory Switch which demonstrates computer memory, Root Planner which is an advanced version of Snail which is mentioned lower down being screen root planning, Explore for Wall which is a mapping of boundaries, Explore for Object which seeks objects and defines shapes and returns home, Tin Pan Alley composing music by barcodes, sounds interesting, Man vs Buggy, Sunseeker which seeks a light and negotiates obstructions and Line Follow which follows black or white lines. So quite an interesting selection of programs to use there with that expensive toy. Jumping from one advert to another then and this one really made me laugh because it says you haven't seen anything like this on a colour monitor before and this advert is completely in black and white. I have nothing more to say about it I just thought it was really amusing. From there I'm moving to the centre of the magazine for this Electron user pullout. As you can see this is volume 1 issue number 3 so they've already been doing this for a couple of issues prior to this one. But something's gone a little bit wrong there because I think this Electron user front cover should be on the right hand side of the page and as you skip through a couple more pages you can quite clearly see on the right hand edge here that this should be the centre of two pages rather than the right hand side so something obviously went wrong with the scan of this one but not to worry I'll do my best to skip through it anyway. So in terms of the actual magazine it seems to be aimed at a more youthful audience, you've got this character called the Micro Kid who appeared on that front cover and also appears in a little comic strip here. The listings feature things like creating Christmas style graphics, anagrams and hangman, all of which seem to have a more childish vibe about them. It's got some reviews of books and software that are geared towards the Electron, although all the programs would work on the BBC Micro as well of course. And it finishes off with a feature called Sounds Exciting which gives you the chance to experiment with the sounds coming out of the Electron. So it's quite interesting that they decided to go with the approach of seeing the Electron as a very junior computer compared to the more powerful BBC Micro and I'm intrigued to see if that carries on when Electron User becomes a standalone publication. Just as an episode of this series wouldn't be complete without looking at an issue of the Micro User, it also wouldn't be complete without looking at one of those vibrant Micro Power adverts and on this occasion there's actually two towards the back of the magazine. First up we have the ad for Cybertron Mission which if you've never played it is kind of a cross between Robotron and Berserk and that was available for the BBC Micro and Electron at a cost of $7.95. There's some reuse of the Micro Power Man here in the bottom left hand corner. He was seen on the advert for Swoop which I showed a couple of episodes back and has been repurposed for this one. But the enemies you can see in this artwork are actually quite close approximations of the ones you see in the game. And the second advert is for a game called Zorn which is a Lunar Lander clone. You can see a few screenshots there and there's also some nice representations of various spacecraft in the artwork. Also there seems to be some mild plagiarisation of the Star Wars logo at the top there. Let's move on now then to the game I'm interested in from this magazine and it's Tower Bridge and you can see again that this should be a two page spread but due to the scanning of this particular magazine it's got a little bit mixed up but the first of the two pages says rescue London's stolen treasures from the phantoms of Tower Bridge and you can quite clearly see half of Tower Bridge there with some phantoms on it and on the other side is the other half of Tower Bridge unsurprisingly you can also see a bunch of money bags and in the middle of what should have been a two page spread you can see a pair of feet disappearing into the Thames. 
For the overview of the game, it says the ghosts at the Tower of London have left their usual haunts. They've taken the treasures from the vaults and scattered them all over Tower Bridge. Your job as custodian is to gather up the treasures one by one and get them back to the bank for safekeeping. It goes on to say the ghosts, while not harmful or mischievous, and if one of them catches you while you're on the way to the bank with some treasure, it will take it off you and put it back on Tower Bridge. And also the bridge is opening and closing all the time. So it's a pretty simplistic introduction, it's not giving too much away about the gameplay. It then goes on to give a list of all the major procedures and variables that are used in the program, and most of them seem pretty straightforward, but the one that stood out to me was Proc Raise, which raises and lowers Tower Bridge, so it'll be interesting to see how that's implemented. Corresponding to that amongst the variables is the variable up percent, which is set to true if the bridge is to be raised. Interestingly, it also stores the XY coordinates of both the player and ghost as variables, with the latter being a raise. As with the majority of micro user type ins, the actual listing doesn't start till later in the magazine, so I'm going to skip over to page 127 now to take a look at that. Here is that listing, and it spans a couple of pages with a total line count of about 160, so not a particularly long program, but what you will notice is that many of the program lines are spread over several lines in the magazine. If I skip back to the first page, there's an explanation for this, and it says the listing was produced using a special formatter which breaks one program line over several lines of listing. When entering a line, don't press return until you come to the next line number. What that means is that the listing is nice and clear and easy to read through, but I do wonder how many times people would have pressed return at the wrong time and ended up making mistakes. In terms of the listing itself, there's not much that stands out. It's all the typical use of procedures and variables as indicated earlier in the magazine. The one thing I was interested in looking at was Proc Raise, which deals with the raising and lowering of Tower Bridge, but actually it's quite a small procedure that just checks a couple of variables and then calls Proc Bridge. Proc Bridge is immediately below and you can see that it executes a number of graphical plotting commands, including G-Call, Move and Draw. This continues on to the following page, which then also deals with the instructions for the game and setting up the graphical characters, as we've seen in all the listings in this episode. It also has a procedure called Proc Setup, which initialises a ton of variables, including the initial XY coordinates for the player and ghost. So that's about it for the listing, other than to mention that if you couldn't be bothered to type it in, it was included in that month's cassette tape offer, but luckily for me, I didn't need to type it in or get the cassette, because it's available as a download from the BBC Micro Games Archive, and we're going to take a look at it now. We begin then with a pretty simplistic Mode 7 title screen, saying Tower Bridge at the top, followed by the author's name, Zen, and then the high score which is 300 points, which doesn't seem exceptionally high a score to try and beat. And then we've got the keyboard controls which are A and Z for up and down, and less than and greater than for left and right, that's also comma and dot if you're looking at the non-shifted versions of those keys. And then you've got the option to either press space to play the game or press return for the instructions, which we should probably have a look at. And the instructions are pretty much the same as what was displayed in the magazine. I think there is a little bit more detail here because it says to collect a treasure, all you have to do is run under the pound signs. The treasure will then be added to the cargo display and by running into the bank you can deposit your loot. Which is a little bit of a contradiction because I thought you were recovering treasure that had been stolen by ghosts. But now it seems to be suggesting that it's actually loot. Anyway, from there you press space to play and you're greeted with a very colourful representation of Tower Bridge which has a number of pound signs scattered around it and you start in the bottom left hand corner in the bank you're a little green stick man who has to go and collect one at a time the pound signs and then deliver them back into the bank. I suppose you could say it's a platform game of sorts, you can climb up the ladders, you can walk across the top of the tower or over the bridge but periodically the bridge opens and closes and if you happen to be walking across it when it does then you'll fall into the Thames and lose a life. For the most part it's fairly straightforward on this first stage, you collect the treasures one at a time, take them back to the bank and when you've got them all the level completes. The only real difficulty you face is that in the bottom right hand corner there's a ghost moving across the screen and if he makes contact with you when you're carrying a treasure then he'll steal that treasure from you and redistribute it somewhere else on the screen. Usually he'll drop it exactly where it came from or in a spot that's along its usual path of movement and that's definitely true on the first stage. On later levels it can drop them anywhere on the playfield. As it said in the instructions, the ghosts don't kill you, so they're just an annoyance rather than a real hazard. The game has small but colourful graphics with cute smiley ghosts and some nice animation on the bridge opening and closing, though that does slow the game down significantly when it occurs. As with most of these games, the sounds are basic, but the noise when picking up and dropping off cargo has a satisfying echo effect. There is a little bit of strategy required when collecting the treasure where the ghosts are, as you need to try and get them to take it and then drop it in a spot that's easier to retrieve it from on a second attempt. Going over the bridge does carry a small amount of risk, but as long as you time your run across for when it's just closed, you're usually pretty safe. That's the only real hazard in the game that can cost you life, so as a result it is quite easy. It's also pretty slow and repetitive collecting all the cargo, so ultimately becomes boring doing the same thing over and over again. It could be improved by allowing you to carry more items at once, giving the risk of losing it all to a ghost versus the reward of finishing the level more quickly. Randomising the spots where you collect cargo from and ghost patrol would also make it more interesting. Ultimately, Tower Bridge is a neat and original idea, but just doesn't have enough going for it to be worth more than a single play, so without the suggested tweaks it wouldn't really have been worth the effort of typing in.
That concludes this episode of the History of BBC Micro Typing Games and another four magazines and games from 1983. This time around I don't think any of the games are necessarily worth the effort of typing in. Fruitworm was the most interesting from a programming perspective, with several programs being chained together and extensive use of machine code and data statements. However, it was basically just Snake when it came down to the game itself. The Grid was probably the best of the bunch gameplay-wise, with a fairly original twist on the Space Invaders theme. Meanwhile, Sea Battle was pretty awful due to the obscene difficulty level, and Tower Bridge was an interesting idea but boring to play. If you've got any thoughts on the games and magazines featured in this episode then please leave a comment and if you enjoyed this video then please give it a like and don't forget you can check out the pinned comment for links to all the games and magazines covered in this episode. I've now finished looking at magazines from 1983 but I'm not quite done with that year as next time I'll be doing something a little different by looking at a book of typing games, 60 programs for the BBC Micro. Don't worry though, I won't be covering all 60 games. Please join me for that in about a month's time and until then stay tuned to this channel for more retro gaming content and thanks very much for watching.